guys, welcome back to another episode of Five Drinks at Midnight. You know the show, we bring the questions, guests bring the drinks, we try to wrap up before midnight. Today we got a good one. We are talking to the director of content for 50 Best Bars, Mark Sansom. But before we do, like and subscribe, hit all the bells, whistles, really help us out. Let's get started. Midnight, five drinks, five questions. Midnight, whatever comes first. How you doing today, sir? Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Tim, for having me on. I'm, I've got to say, I'm, I'm buzzing about this. This is um, certainly probably the, the, the most fun podcast I've uh, I've been invited to come on to. So thank you very much for having me. Oh, thank you for that. I mean, they just made my day. That is absolutely amazing. Uh, we're happy to have you. And again, I'm so glad that you said yes, because uh, I bet you got some good stories to tell. So uh, uh I guess our first question is, what are we drinking first? Okay, right. So first up, and I realise I might have made a bit of uh, bit of an error doing this one first, but it is um, it's a drink which has been by my side for a long time, and that's um, it's an orange Barocca, which I'm not sure if you guys in the states have it as we do in Europe. Uh, you we have. do. Uh, I, I got it off of Amazon, so that's uh, <laughs> I was I was not sure if it, that's what it was uh, supposed to be, yeah. but. Uh, Essentially, it's uh, well, it's an effervescent, uh, well, fizzing tablet, as you as you'll be able to see in a second. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's been it's been by my side, like I say, for for many years, and it's next to basically next to my bed for after any sort of over exuberance. And it also, yeah, the top's quite hard to get off. I was like, um, yeah, uh, uh, yeah, and it's um, it's a, as good a preventative as it is a uh, fixer. So right. yeah, it's kind of in she goes. All right. And look at that, just all sparkly. <laughs> yeah, that um, yeah, that sort of plunky, fizzy noise has has punctuated my uh, my my teenage years all the way up to today. So as, I'm, I'm very very glad that they're still in they're still in production. Put it that way. <laughs> but again, when you said, I was like, I was like, what what's what's the specs? I've never even heard of this drink. And then like, I was like, I googled it, and then I was like, I had to send you the email being. Is this yeah. the right one? And you're like, yeah, yep, yeah. that's it. So, yeah. yeah it's, it's essentially vitamin C and B vitamins. Um, good restorative stuff. So, cheers. cheers. <laughs> uh, what do you think? All right. That's, I think you got me hooked. I mean, that, that's pretty <laughs> damn. It's not disgusting, is it? No, not at all. Like, I was expecting it to be a little bit medicine y, but no, that's, yeah. that's, uh, you know, that's pretty damn good. I, yeah, I, well, I mean, once you got through the pack, um, I reckon you'll be, yeah, you'll be, you'll be a convert. It's, yeah, um, I, I think you got me. I mean, I think that's a good uh, wake up drink. So yeah, there was a period uh, in my university years where they would be, they'd be double dropped with with vodka in the morning, okay. which, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> which uh, yeah, less said about that the better. But they're, yeah, uh, probably yeah, yeah, they're good stuff. All right, well then, uh, let's just jump right into it. Rip the Band-Aid off. Question one, your background is really fascinating uh, to me, which is why we, we kind of reached out. But you you have, you're written for Esquire, Mr. Porter, The Times, Wallpaper. You were the editor for Men's Health. And then no. now you're like the content editor for 50 Best Bars and Restaurants in the World. How does one get into that space, jumping from what seemed to be fitness and health to go into food and booze yeah oh, well um yeah just a quick correction i wasn't the editor of um of men's health in the uk i was i was a commissioning editor which essentially oh. meant um I, I paid people to write stories about running around and jumping up and down a lot and and, and lifting heavy things um my apologies but, we'll fix that yeah, no, no, yeah 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 no probs no probs but um yeah it's been um it's been an interesting one to be honest i did a uh, started at university as most people did, um, sort of bussing tables, working, um, working behind bars, and I, I did that when I was living at home in the southeast of the UK. Really, really sort of 
got on board with the vibe in bars and restaurants and the people who sort of staff them uh, really enjoyed it then went and did a uh, English literature degree at university in, in, the, in the UK um, and finished and I was like I really don't really fancy going out to do some proper work this 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 uh, nine to five just just really isn't isn't, isn't really doing it for me so I did a, a master's in journalism and then was really fortunate fortunate to essentially just stumble on onto a job in food criticism in in London um, for Square Meal magazine people there were amazing met some well, people I'm still friends with today. I'm playing golf with um, my first boss tomorrow. Um, just, and then from then on, it just I, I completely fell in love with hospitality, the, the writing side of hospitality, and the people and interviewing people around it. So that was amazing. And then I moved to work at Men's Health, which was quite a quite a career sort of shift. Um, it, essentially, I was doing their food and drink content. I did do some sort of fitness stuff, but they uh, writing a lot about chicken. Um, telling people how different ways to eat eggs, <laughs> trying to convince chefs to, um, to to give me recipes with with far less fat content than they would usually pe probably be used to using. Um, did that for four years, loved that. Uh, yeah, then went work to work for Food and Travel magazine, uh, where I finished up as editor. So yeah, that was um, lots of time spent on beaches, beach bars, um, doing fuck all, which I, I particularly enjoy. Um, but yeah, we, we managed to do some really good things with that. We launched, we've got eight into what well, we had eight international editions with that magazine and I launched sort of three of them so that was good fun uh, and yeah for the last four years um, I've been with the world's 50 best which is which is like the job of dreams to be honest it, it's hard work but it's there's a lot of travel but um, I tell you what I love it mate I'm, I'm really lucky to have the position that I do. Could you explain a little bit what what your job actually is other than I mean we've watched you on you know stage Let's get this party started. Put your glasses down and put your hands together to welcome the director of content for the world's 50 best bars, Mark Sansom. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the 14th edition of the world's 50 best bars, sponsored by Perrier, taking place live from Barcelona. What, what is what your job all entail? Yeah, so, um, where, where to start? So, I mean, for your for your viewers who don't know what the world's fifty best is, essentially we are a organisation which ranks which ranks bars. Um, I work on the bars division um, and help out a bit with the with the restaurants division. And we're kind of it's like the, we've got the largest number of voters of any sort of bars awards out there. We've got six hundred and fifty voters in twenty eight different regions across the world. So we've kind of got the most robust judging academy out there, uh, and certainly the largest and the only one which is audited by Deloitte, um, who actually come in and look at our data. So we know that the results, when we say that this is the world's best bar, we can be confident that we've got the, the selection has come from the biggest pool of people and the most qualified pool of people. So essentially it's up to me to select the academy chairs in the different regions who then select the voters. Um, and the, I'm sort of in charge of that pool of people. So I kind of can be blamed for any results, good or otherwise, that um, that come about. And when um, the buck kind of stops with me on that, um, which which is fair enough. And um, because we put so much time into getting those the best voters, I, I'm kind of happy to come out and defend and celebrate all those bars which are end up on our list. So that's probably the most important part of my job: um, speaking to people in bar scenes, traveling, finding bars, um, speaking to those people behind the bars about what's really what are the key issues in their in their sort of local bar scenes uh, and yeah I sort of curate all the content for the website so having a bit of a journalism background is is really helpful I'll sort of commission writers all over the world to talk about their own bar scenes and then about our award winners um, and yeah I also curate the uh, the 50 best discovery search engine which is like our 50 best um, eat more egalitarian side basically we've got 3,000 uh, well sorry we've got two and a half thousand at the moment but soon got soon to go up to 3,200 um, different restaurants and bars. So I go and sort of manage the commissioning process on that and uh, the selection process of the writers and calling in the images. So yeah, it's pretty, it's a varied job. Um, but obviously, yeah, I like to, mainly I like to sit at the end of the bar and uh, and drink lots of nice drinks. That's the, that's the crux of it. That's awesome. And yeah. uh, do you travel a lot? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's um, obviously can't get to all of the bars on the list, but um, I try to get to as many, as much of the, as many different continents and as many different cities as I can to go and speak to those people and try those bars. Um, but yeah, we've even since the post-pandemic period, it's been bonkers with 50 Best. So we've actually, well, 
Our first sort of live event was in Antwerp, which was the world's 50 best restaurants in October last year. Um, since then, we went to we, we put on an event in 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 Mexico for Latin America's 50 best restaurants. In January last year, sorry February last year, we launched Middle East and North Africa's 50 best restaurants. So I spent a week in Abu Dhabi, which is just a great city. Yeah. Uh, and then we had uh, Asia's 50 best restaurants, which was in Bangkok. Asia's 50 best bars, which was also in Bangkok. Um, and we also launched North America's 50 best bars in June, which yep. um, which was probably the highlight of my career, to be honest. It's the first um, first launch I'd probably been in charge of um, with 50 best. And it, the way it was received among the North American bar community just completely still gives me the chills now. man. I still get the get the goosebumps about it. Um, but that was just amazing. Great week in New York for that. Um, and then off the back of that, basically, we did the world's 50 best restaurants in London, which was um, sort of on home turf for me. And then, yeah, we've just got just finished in Barcelona um, for the world's 50 best bars. So what's that? That's sort of seven trips in yeah, in, 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 in 12 months. So it's been um, I love travel. It's um, it's it's a real perk of the job. I see it as something which I'm really fortunate to be able to do um, and to see so many happy faces generally as part of the awards. When people make our lists, it makes yeah. it all makes it all worthwhile. And yeah, I just I just love it. Yeah. Uh, the, the parties that you guys had in New York City, I think that was uh one of the, the funnest weeks I've had, I mean, I've lived in New York now forever. And uh, I, I got to say when the 50 best North America was here in New York, like the, the, the bar parties were absolutely amazing. And it was probably the, the funnest week I've had. And again, I'm, I'm not even a, like a participant in any of that. I was just, you know, going to events and stuff. And it was just funny. It's great, isn't it? Like we, we actually count up the number of satellite guest ships and various events that go on around our events. Um, and it's absolutely bonkers. In Barcelona, just gone, there were 74 across four days. Don't even know how that happened. Uh, in Bangkok, there was sort of 50 odd. Uh, New York, there was 50 odd as well. Bar bartenders, brands coming in from all over the world to um, to just be a part of it. And to be to have our event at the core of that is um, is just just superb. And we yeah. uh, we can't be can't be more grateful that people. It, it was a, it was amazing. And congratulations again for launching north america 50 yeah thanks man it's, um, I mean, it's been a long time been a long time coming but we're um yeah we put a lot of research into it because it's such a north america new york is the it's the original cocktail capital in new york and the the way that the the the, the art of the cocktail is appreciated from the south right up to right up to the north is is like nowhere else in the world so we really wanted to make sure we we got it right with um, north america awesome uh not looking for a scoop or anything like that or where but would you guys consider doing more regions like North America? Like, I mean, not asking yeah. for like next ones or whatever, but is the plan Absolutely. to do? Absolutely, yeah, that's completely on the table. The way um, the way we see it is the more regional um, award ceremonies we do, both across restaurants and bars, the more of the world we can sort of put in the spotlight. Um, across our social channels, we've got like two and a half million global viewers now, which is just, which is huge. And again, just kind of bonkers. Um, so the more regions we can highlight, like we started with Middle East and North Africa last year, which we launched, and what that's done for the region is just amazing. On the global stage now, there's lots of international chefs in there who are, who are sort of applying their trade, doing some amazing stuff. And likewise, North America is an obvious one, but even though they take a lot of time and research and planning, um, yeah, we, we don't rule any region off, out off the table because, yeah, we're all about celebrating the whole world, right? Question two, drink two. What are we drinking? So we've got um, a classic, classic Negroni up next. And uh, why a Negroni? I mean, mainly because I, I absolutely love Negronis. Um, but also, it's it's kind of the first first cocktail that really turned me on to drinking cocktails. Um, okay. Kind of a shame to admit, I, I through my sort of formative years, teens, um, early twenties, I only really knew those kind of sweet, awful sugary concoctions that you'd either get in um, di di distributable pubs and on the beaches of um, pretty shoddy holiday resorts. Yep, yep. Uh, and it wasn't until sort of probably my early 30s where somebody gave me a Negroni. I was like, well, right, so this can actually be, they can actually be bloody nice drinks as well as, as something which is, is more of a means to an end. And since then, yeah, I just, just absolutely adored Negronis. Through, um, 
through the lockdown, I, I drank a lot of them. Um, <laughs> uh, like five o'clock every day, I think I would. Um, well, actually, my wife, um, she got she, she's not a huge drinker, not a huge cocktail drinker anyway. And um, she just really got into the uh, the art of making them. And she makes I have to say this because um, she made this one uh, the best Negronis uh, in the world, in my opinion. There you go. I, I, I mean, who can one argue? It's exactly. made with love, so therefore, like that's the number one ingredient. So you, you can't argue that one. So yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, they're 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 an accessible drink. It's simple to make um, for any home bartender. Things of equal equal volume are, are quite easy to easy to get to grips with. Um, yeah. Ingredients are available everywhere. Um, but they, there's so many poorly made ones, don't you think? When you go into bars, absolutely. It's it's one of the an old fashioned and a Negroni are uh, like basically my two like cocktail measuring uh yeah if, if, if you can't make a three ingredient cocktail I, i'm just gonna stick to straight pours or even maybe just soda because like yeah it's just it, it's so it's not that hard of a drink but it's also so many people do do mess it up and like or you get their spin on it, and I'm like, I don't want your spin. I want a classic. Right. If Negroni. I get another, yeah, another. If I get another twist on Negroni, it's like, I mean, why well, fuck with the classics? You know, if it's yeah. if something something's a classic for a reason. Uh, having said that, a mezcal Negroni is a real sort of uh, a real guilty pleasure of mine as well. That that that's a, that's a good spirit swap in my opinion. Yep. Uh, I don't know. Uh, I'm sure you have been, uh, but here in New York, uh, there is a bar called Temple Bar. Uh, and uh, they have a blue Negroni, which again I'm totally down for because it's just blue. That's yeah, yeah it's it's a Negroni, but it's blue, and I am totally for down that. for it. So like that is, yeah, uh, yeah. Um, but all right, well then, uh, question two, getting back into a little bit of the fifty best bars. How does the process kind of work? Because when people ask me, like you know, how is Katana Kitten considered one of the fifty best bars? And my response is because it's fucking awesome. I'm sure mm. there's a much more like technical uh, term uh, and structure that goes into it. What what goes into picking a fifty vest? For sure, I mean, I mean, case in point, it is fucking awesome. So I think that's that's probably the the most important thing that that's, that you need to understand. But yeah, like I was saying um, a little while ago, so we have these 28 regions all across the world, right? Um, and each of those regions is headed up by an academy chair, who is generally a a drinks writer, a drinks educator, um, or somebody who's really, really ingrained in that area. And then we ask them at 50 Best to select a panel within that within that um, academy region. And that, that panel is made up of 50% bartenders and bar owners, 25% drinks writers and drinks educators, and another 25% um, what we call uh, cocktail aficionados which are essentially bar flies. So people who sit on the other side, people who sit on the other side of the bar um, who have a different opinion to those of people who are, who are operators essentially. So with that mix, we then ask them each to, to cast seven votes. And we're really, really hot and really strong on the fact that we don't ask for any criteria. Um, what, what might be my favorite bar is gonna be completely different to what your favorite bar is, right? And we don't wanna take that Michelin level of having to grade every single element and tick those boxes because we put so much time and effort into getting the right people who are so so sort of senior and experienced in their industries. We want to trust them to make the decisions. So yeah, we ask them to name the seven best bar experiences of the voting window, which is the previous 18 months. Um, so yeah, essentially we get that data, um, comes in on a very, um, a very sort of secret, sophisticated voting system. That comes in. We uh, we look at the results. I watch the results as they come in, and it's probably the it's the best three weeks of my year watching who's going number one. And then, it's, <laughs> and then um, at the end of that voting window, oh, sorry, the, the yeah the voting period, we uh, well I send the, the all the results, all the data from everyone's votes over to Deloitte. Deloitte tally, tally everything up, make sure it's all legit. They do their spot checks. They call the voters to make sure that they've been in the bars at those particular times, and then they deliver me back a list, and then. I basically have to sit on my hands uh, and not get too drunk for about three months while uh, and not tell anyone any of the results. But fortunately, um, touch wood, there haven't been any leaks in my uh, in my tenure. But it's been uh, it's a hard three months not being able to tell people stuff. Right? I, I bet, I bet, I, it's got to be crazy. Um, all like I think it, it, it's fascinating that there is no criteria. So like you could walk into a bar and another person could go in and have 
a completely different experience and or you you could rate it completely you could say it's awesome and they could say it's terrible and like but yet the service could have been the same so like there that the, there's no criteria i think is absolutely yeah. fascinating it's, I, th I think it's a really, really important thing that that we actually stick to that and we don't want people to grade each different element of the bar experience but quite interesting you pick up on the different uh, different sort of times of, of going in and, and experiencing those different services so i was chatting to um steve schneider um the director of employees only a guy i'm sure you're familiar with and your listeners will be will be familiar oh, yeah. with and either when i was out in north america doing some pr for, for north america 50 best bars a couple of months before we launched it sat down with steve had a, had a few drinks and a, a couple of tequilas with him and he was like look you need to try and look to shake up the voting just a little bit um i, mean, I really appreciate what you guys do but what somebody experiences when they come in on a lunch service is going to be completely different to what they experience when they come in at 10 p.m. on a Friday night when when they're in the shit, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, so thanks to Steve's comments, I went away and had a long hard think about it. So the votes, the votes in future, we're going to ask each of the the panelists to let us know which time of day they went in. If it was lunch, if it was essentially afternoon or lunchtime, afternoon, early evening, night, and then I won't call it this, but yeah, in the shit at 1 a.m. Um, yeah. But it's, and we're going to get that data back and look to feed that into the results as well. So a big thanks to Steve if he happens to pick this up. But um, I haven't told him that we're actually going to incorporate that yet. But it's a really good suggestion. And look, we want to always hear from our bar community, uh, people like Steve, industry leaders, anyone who who thinks that they can really add value to our awards. And it's great that we work in a company where we can be actually quite reactive and and add those kind of new new systems in quite relatively quickly. So. Yeah, always looking to evolve it, always looking to make it more relevant. And yeah, it all comes down to that no criteria and, and trusting the voters that we have. That's awesome. Uh, and I, I think that that is a great suggestion too, because yeah, like yeah, good visiting point. a bar at you know noon on a, a Tuesday is going to exactly. be way different than Thursday at you know 11.30 at night. So yeah, like that's... Uh, uh, and it, it's true that all your, uh, the voters are all anonymous, correct? Like no one knows who they like are or anything like that, right? It's, exactly, it's all... yeah. So I mean, the 28 Academy chairs are the only named voters. Um, us at 50 Best, we don't, we don't have a vote. We just, we just collate the votes. Um, so yeah, the 28 Academy chairs and then all of the other, the panel of 650 or 600 and my maths is terrible 622 uh not including the uh, not included the, the 28 academy chairs um yeah they're all anonymous now we do get the occasional um leak where somebody's gone in there as oh, I'm, a, I'm a 50 best voter um wanting free drinks or what have you uh but whenever that gets back to me or us at the, in the team we um we strike cool. through their votes and they'll never be asked again so yes um in essence all of our 650 voters should be uh, should be anonymous well, now we know how it works. So I can now point everybody to this question two of this interview and just be like, this is how exactly. it works. But also you can just trust me, the bar's fucking yeah. off. So like, that's, yeah, that's bar's fucking awesome. But yeah, it's also, it's also on our website. Um, yeah, yeah. All, the, all, all the data is on their uh, worlds50bestbars.com. It's uh, F under FAQs if there's anything. Well, it explains it far better the, than I can. And then uh, do you uh, do any of the like voting? Like if someone sees you walking into the, their establishment, you're just there to, to drink or do you actually do like voting as well? I don't vote. No, none of the none of the team at 50 Best, um, none of the 50 team at 50 Best vote at all. No. So but yeah, when I walk into a bar, um, yeah, I, I actually quite like it when when nobody knows who I am. It's much much, um, much better experience generally. Just just well, I, I I can imagine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, you're you're probably a very well known face when someone walks oh, oh, in. So. No, no, not really, not really. Um, but yes. Yeah, so. Question three, drink three. What are we drinking? We have got um, yeah, a, a dry gin martini with um, with a lemon twist. Cheers. Cheers. Why martinis? Sure. Um, it's kind of linked to, to drink one, actually. Um, during the lockdown, I, I think I drank so many Negronis, I put on put on a fair, fair, fair bit of weight. Um, and as soon as the uh, as soon as the lockdown had finished, I went into Connaught Bar, which is a, a second two time uh, world's best bar with 50 best uh, and just an amazing, amazing space. And Agostino Peroni who's the director of mixology there. He kind of noticed that I'd uh, <laughs> that I'd uh, been packing on the timber through through lockdown. Um, it, was, it was it was quite significant, and uh, and he said, "Mark, 
You've been drinking too many Negronis over uh, over the uh, over the sort of the wintered period. Um, so you need to you need to get on the martinis. So he went and he made me he made me a martini. I've always liked martinis, but whenever I do drink Negronis, it's his voice in my ear that that um, the the red bitters, the Campari, is always is too much sugar. So um, so yeah, martinis over Negronis. There you go, a, a martini diet. I mean, I think uh, that worked in the fifties here in the states. So I mean, absolutely, keep it going. Yeah, no, that, those the words of um, uh, in, in the Wolf of Wall Street. It's not Christian Bale, is it? It's uh... well, Hector. Here's the game plan. You're gonna bring us two absolute martinis. You know how I like them, straight up. And then precisely seven and one half minutes after that, you're gonna bring us two more. Then two more after that every five minutes until one of us passes the fuck out yeah yeah uh no uh, matthew mcconaughey matthew uh, mcconaughey of course yeah 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 yeah, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah. pats his chest yeah, and yeah, yeah. whenever whenever i drink more than two it's it's generally a bad result but the um this particular martini again i've I've got to thank my, my next door neighbor, a guy called um well just before lockdown started i moved into a new apartment it's um, like a new build block in um in south london and we both moved in at the same time, and it turned out that he was just a great cocktail barman. He's, he'd worked in he'd worked in bars uh, all over the southwest of the UK um, before we sort of just were sort of flung together. Um, so it's very very convenient to have. We live just two flats on the two apartments on the top floor. So through lot throughout lockdown, we basically spent our time exchanging um, exchanging <laughs> cocktails. And his uh, his martinis are certainly up there with with those from the the Connaught. But. Very nice. I mean, sending your wife's uh, best Negronis over and then getting a martini back is, is you know, that's, that's precisely a... that. That's literally our, that was our eighteen months of uh, of staying in the flat. So yeah, at least it, at least we were well watered. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, on to question three. We call this one uh, the talking shit segment since we're three drinks in and we're we're ready to go. Don't worry, it's not anything bad. But in your opinion. What's the difference between hospitality and service? Oh, that's a bloody good question. Um, I guess the hospitality is is the way you're sort of made to feel when you when you cross the threshold. You know, it's everything from that first contact point with um, a member of staff in the bar, uh, and the whole and everything up to the point when you leave. You pay your check and then you're you're away out the bar. Service to me is probably the more formal formulaic side of that the, the structures which bars or restaurants put in place to actually deliver you your drinks and deliver you your food but the hospitality to me is yeah it's about the people it's about the the way you're made to feel when you come in the vibe you feel when you sit down the the ambience the the, the level of the music the lighting the the clink of the glasses you know for me that's the that's the more sort of all-encompassing um feel to it than and service seems like the more the more sort of like the rudiments the the, the getting shit done kind of stuff gotcha Perfect. Well, what about you? What about I mean, you? Yeah, I, I think, you know, service is, you know, just serving, you know, getting shit done, like you said. And hospitality is, you know, how, you know, you want to feel loved. Like, you want to be, you know, when I walk into a pub, I want people, like, I don't want necessarily, like, know my name cheer style. But, like, yeah. I want people to greet me and say hi, like, throw the napkin down, ready to go. And, like, and again, if it's one of my locals, like... I already like that, you know, there's an old fashioned sitting there like waiting for me by the time like I walk in the door and by the time I get round to my spot in the bar, there's a, a drink waiting for me. So again, like I want to feel loved, I, I guess is the big thing. And I think that's what hospitality is in my I opinion. That. I is, think like speaking about the post pandemic era, um, it's just become so much more important, I think, because I mean, I don't know, I don't know what it was like in the States, but in the UK and people I've spoken to over in Asia, because when you came out of the pandemic, you had to get those reservations, right? You had yeah. to you had to book in. You knew they were you, you weren't going to get in unless you had made one of those fifty seats in the bar or whatever. Yep, yep. And there was just less of the feel that you were going to bar hop or move on in between in between properties, in between venues across the course of the night, because the the, the fear of the unknown and being knocked or being turned away was right. And yep. you didn't you didn't want to you don't want to be standing outside in the cold on in London or New York in February when, yeah, when we were definitely released. not. Like, so, I mean, I'll say um, I'll take London February over a New York February. But at least at least New York's a city that knows how to deal with cold weather. Um, yeah. In London, if <laughs> the one sniff of snow um, and then it literally grinds to a halt. There's no 
there's no sort of like precaution for it, even though we know that we're going to get at least two or three decent snow dumps throughout the course of the winter. It doesn't mean that people in London uh, know how to prepare for it. Everyone's falling over, cars are crashing. It's uh, it's a sorry state of affairs compared to how, to how you guys deal with it. Yeah, but I, well, I mean, again, I think that was a great answer to question three and we didn't talk that much smack. So it worked out great for everybody. <laughs> yeah. uh, question four, drink four, what are we drinking? So um, what we've got is, is a essentially just a lager, a premium strength lager. Um, this one is, this happens to be my favorite, uh, brand of lager, not just because it's a 50 best sponsor, honestly, um, it's <laughs> Asahi, which is a, uh, uh see, nice. I feel, I feel like I'm in Wayne's world, you know? There you go. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, a premium strength lager, um, or PSL as I kind of abbreviate it to came from, uh, the days when I was working at men's health magazine. Uh, we, uh, of, a, of an afternoon, our editor, uh, Toby, would say, oh, it's a PSL meeting today. Uh, <laughs> so that would mean, essentially, that we could decamp to the pub um, at sort of two, three o'clock and drink uh, drink uh, uh, high strength, high strength beer on Hearst Magazine's dime for, uh, for the rest of the afternoon. So PSL, premium strength lager, has always um, always held a, a position close to my heart. It's um, it's. it's it's a good drink. Well, cheers to that. I mean, I'm down yep. for that as well. Like, I think that's, uh, I'm going to start using that as a, in my meeting, like being like, all right, it's a PSL. Yeah. Go to the pub. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to, you were traipsing around New York asking for, uh, asking for PSL though, man. Oh, it's fine. It was just, uh, it was just, yeah, it was just, a. Uh, again, I should have asked better questions on our, our drinks, no. but that's, that's fine. Uh, all right. So then question four. You, you guys, you talked a little bit about it, but you have the 50 best discovery list, which is absolutely amazing. I use it quite a bit because I'm one of those people that travels to, and make sure to find like you, you're traveling for a pub. Like I, I will go for a restaurant. I will go like my Japan trip was all planned around like bars and everything of where we were eating and drinking. Uh, so for you, is there a place that you constantly go to that's on that list and then also is there a place that you want to go to God, oh that's a again a jolly good question um so yeah i mean just a bit of a background about 50 best discovery we we, we kind of we only launched it in 2019 immediately pre-pandemic which was which was a uh, great call like, yeah, really, yeah. really good <laughs> um but we, we launched it with a view that we really wanted to start influencing people's travel plans. Now, we could we, at that point, we were only celebrating the top 50 bars or restaurants in the world. And then we extended it to the 51 to 100. But that's still only 100 venues, right? That's still only 100 of, of hundreds of thousands all across the world. And like I say, with the Restaurants Voting Academy, we have um, we have 1,100 voters. With bars, we have nearly 700. So... Every year we do the, we do that we, when we get the results from the vote, we're just sitting on this mine of data, all of these great bars and restaurants, which are, which are just outstanding, which have received these critics votes, but we haven't been able to do anything with it. So with 50 Best Discovery, we're able to dig deeper into the list and dig deeper into those bars and restaurants, which have received votes, but just not quite enough to get onto the list. Um, so launching it in 2019 with um, we launched it with 1100 venues uh, and then in 2021 immediately after the pandemic we added another we added another sort of uh, just under a thousand to bring it up to 2500 and then in November on November 11th we're actually bringing it up to 3100 so we're using all that data that we've got and all those great experiences and really valid experiences from people all over the world to give people a greater a greater range of choice and a greater a greater ability to actually go to venues which which might not be well lots of the venues as soon as you get onto a 50 best list you're banged out you're booked you're booked for weeks months years ahead there's a great story from um uh, noma which was uh, which is which was has held the world's best restaurant spot uh, from copenhagen a record five times when they got in um the first time which i think was 2016 but i might need to check my facts on that they, uh, Remy, Remy Redzepi, the, the chef owner of that premises, he's, he turned on his website uh, and it completely crashed and they could have filled their, could have filled their reservations diary for the next, for the next three years, just with, with, with just the news that they had become the world's best restaurant, um, which is obviously really reassuring for us, but 
it's not very egalitarian because we get millions of hits when when we released each list. But then the people, you know, people aren't going to be able to book into the world's best bar or the world's best restaurant. So yeah, essentially, fifty best discovery wants is our opportunity to give people a lot more, a lot more opportunity to book amazing restaurants and bars. I'm sorry, that was that was a roundabout way. So going <laughs> going back to your original question, is there one that that I return to time and time again? Yeah, um, I don't like to pick favourites because it's um, it's not really it's not really fair on, on other restaurants. But there's a restaurant in London. Um, which actually made the 51 to 100 list this year called Brat, which is just an amazing, uh, amazing venue. It's inspired by like, the Basque, uh, Basque grilling tradition. Okay. So different heights, uh, different heights of grill to depending on the cut or whichever protein is on the on the slate at the time. And the guy, Thomas Parry, who who runs that restaurant, um, a Welsh, Welsh guy, which is a, a country in the west of the UK, um he's just amazingly talented and i'll go back there as much as i can that's really good but there's also places like um the smoking goat which is like a little like a thai restaurant uh, which actually very very near brat where i've had some really really nice experiences there um and yeah it's just it's just a really good really good place to find find those kind of uh, restaurants and bars which are off of our list but absolutely worth traveling to yeah i i i mean again when people ask me uh you know where should i drink in new york i just i have yeah. the new york page it's just bookmarked and i'm just like copy paste here you go and like majority of my favorite bars are right dead set in the center and i'm like you can just pick any of them right there and you'll be Tim, i can't tell you how reassuring that is to hear i mean when you whenever you launch one of these look it's a gamble right we, we invested a lot of money into creating the search engine making it as as attemptedly user-friendly and as accessible and as intuitive as we possibly could so whenever somebody like you, who's obviously very experienced in the industry, tells us that we're doing the right thing, it makes yeah. it, it really does make it worthwhile. So thank you, man. Yeah, no, absolutely. Again, and you have like, again, it's from Attaboy, like Dutch Kills, Little Branch, they're all right there. Like, I mean, all the Sasha's places are right there. Like, it, yeah. it, it's absolutely amazing. Like, it, it's just, yeah, it's, uh, I just. I've like, still not been to Bemelman's though. I need to get my ass there. Okay. Yeah. Well. Let me know if you need a drinking buddy. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> Next year. Question five, drink five. What are we drinking? So, Tim, uh, we've got we've got some wine um, from, from northern Italy. Uh, so this this is a Barolo, um, and it's and it's one of my favourite producers. My reasons for, for choosing it are kind of, they're pretty straightforward. Uh, I, I just really enjoy drinking it. <laughs> and it's always the drink which I which I tend to, to end, end the night on. I'll probably drink too much of it. Um, when I get in from work, I will, will tend to pour a glass of, of whatever whatever the, whatever's in the cellar from uh, that's available at the time. And I just really, it's it's kind of one of those drinks which I always always come back to. It's reliable. It's you don't have to drink too much of it. One glass just gives you that warm hug that that, that you want at the end of the day. Um, and yeah, there's there's no real story behind it, which is probably not much of a not, not doing you any favors for your podcast. <laughs> well, again, I like it. Is probably the best reason ever to drink anything. So it's just that's the way I would yeah. like it. So that's the way I want to drink it. I mean, yeah, I mean, there was yeah, there was I had a very uh, it kind of comes back to I've, I've traveled Italy like quite a lot in the summer and gone to gone to some really nice places. But the, probably my best Italian experience, um, my wife and I, we, we just got away on Boxing Day one year. Um, we we went to we went to northern Italy, hired a like a small lodge and just sat in red books um, and, and drank a lot of a lot of northern Italian wine for the for the preceding two days before we got back on, on New Year's Eve. And uh, really cracked on for a big night, but it was uh, it, it was just a really nice opportunity to take stock. And I think Italy, particularly northern Italy, you know, it's just one of those places where you can you can go into the hills. Nobody knows who you are. Nobody gives a gives a damn about who you are. But you can just wander around, go and eat in great restaurants, drink some great wine at like ridiculously well, what what I would say cheap, and probably what you would say cheap in in North America. But um, the wine is is to access this kind of wine in in the uk is is jolly tricky and i know sure. it's the same it's the same for you guys in in, in well in new york and in yeah. anywhere anywhere outside italy basically but it's the kind of place where you can just go settle in drink some great stuff for relatively inexpensive prices and have a great time awesome i mean yeah 
Italy is amazing. So yeah. And then the bar scene there is well, categorically and empirically, it's the it's the most up and coming bar scene in the world. Like in the most recent in the most recent fifty best list that we announced, well, barely three weeks ago. Um, there's now sort of four cities in 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 Italy on the radar. So obviously there's Rome and Milano, which are the which are the ones that you'd recognise. But it was the first ever bar from Naples made the list down in the yeah. south, um, and also from Florence, which is as well as being one of the amazing gastronomic capitals, is now being really known for its drinks as well. And like, yeah. but for any country with um, a population the size of Italy to have four four different cities on the map, um, I'd need to I need to again check my facts. But I think there's there's probably only four cities from the states which um, which have got it got it on the map. There's yeah. only one in the UK. In Spain, there's two. Um, in Australia, there's only there's two as well as Melbourne and Sydney. So I, it's it's probably the best place where yeah. you can go and have a relatively compact, really good drinking itinerary and and, and go to some of the world's best bars. So yeah, it's really, yeah, it doesn't need the, the tourism board doesn't need my help to tell people to go to Italy, particularly for. Dilly from um, stateside visitors, but it's uh, it's a great great place to go to. Yeah, I, I, yeah, like they killed that fifty best this year, and like it just yeah, using dis discovery. I mean, I I got them all bookmarked, and I'm ready. Yeah, like it's it's yeah, it's on my list of places to be checked out. But what's your next trip, man? Where are you going next? I I have to get back over to Ireland. I have friends and family that I haven't seen in years. Uh, that just I really need to share a pint with them before like that. where in ireland uh D dublin every i mean everywhere like uh gotta get into belfast uh i have friends uh uh they're in dunlock so like that like gotta get like right there uh they just opened a pub there and so like i have to go uh guest bartend and, and destroy yeah, their yeah, pub yeah. and so like it, it just yeah like it, it's friends that i i've just haven't seen in forever and well, any 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 sort of guest shift in in rural island is is an easy is an easy bartend right you yep. <laughs> <laughs> you got you got jameson and you've yeah, got yeah. uh you've yeah. got, you got yeah, pull the pint put the yeah. the glass up to the thing it, yeah yeah yeah, yeah. A little measure and yeah you're done yeah it's yeah uh yeah i got kicked out of uh my favorite irish story is uh there there's a bar on south william street in downtown dublin uh called the old stand and I went in and I asked for an old fashioned, and the guy just kicked me right the fuck out. He was like, "Get Brilliant. the fuck out of here!" I don't have. And I bet you, you, you left with that. You were happy to leave on the back of that. Well, well I mean, I was like, I, I, I told him that I ended up just drinking powers. I was like, oh, "I'm sorry, I didn't mean to." Open <laughs> but like, he was just like, "I don't have time to." He's like, "I don't even have cherries. I, just, I don't. My sugar's in packets." He was just like, "Get the fuck out!" And I was like, "Yeah, yeah, yeah, just on. go, just go." <laughs> I was like, "All right, but yeah." All right. So, question five. Uh, comes down to the flip of the whiskey Wednesday coin. You can flip it, you oh, can yeah. spin it, you can do whatever you want. You don't have to answer. The coin will give us the answer. It will. You can answer will. if you want. So, question five. We've talked about the voters for 50 best bars, uh, how they are all anonymous. So, does that make you the most powerful cult leader in the world? Uh, fuck you to start with. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, or, I, I mean, maybe not cult. Maybe it's just secret society. So you're the most powerful secret society leader. I mean, it's not that secret, to be fair. We're hardly Illuminati, right? And I know, to, I know that you've got the um, you've got the Illuminati eye on your yeah, yeah. Um, on your. So perhaps you were perhaps you were one of us. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Look, we 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 try, we. We're, we're as open as we can be. We, we obviously, we think it's very important for the voters to remain anonymous because if they're not anonymous, they can go into bars and receive a different level of hospitality that you and I might get when we yeah. go in there. So it's, um, yeah. No, I'm all for it. It was just, a, it's just a fun way to say thank you and uh, really uh, just end the show on just a silly, silly question. So Mark, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Uh, again, if you're in New York, let me know if you need a drinking buddy. I'm going to come to London and I will, we'll look you up. We'll, we'll share some pints so very soon. So right, again, 100%. thank you so much for your time and doing the show. We really appreciate it. Cheers Absolute to you joy. and Tim. all your success, man. Like, pleasure. You, you Absolute guys pleasure. Thank you very much. It's, uh, and I love your, I love your, uh, I love, I love everything about what you do. It's, uh, it's really, really enjoyable way 
to approach an industry which can be a little bit staid and a little bit um, stuck in the mud, but you, you do it brilliantly. So cheers. Thank you very cheers. much for having me on. Thanks so much. Take care.